Hello, and welcome to Writing Women, the show where I talk about the women who exist in fiction and the people who created them. This week is going to be the third and final book in the Provost Dog Trilogy by Tamara Pierce, Mastiff. This one's going to be a bit of a doozy. Based on the conversations I've seen around this book, it seems to be the most hotly debated one in the entire series. People can't decide if it's this book they have a problem with, or Bloodhound, or both. Again, I have not read this book since the first time I read it upon release, and also again, I feel a lot different about it now than I did then. I think that's because reading them in rapid succession now, rather than spaced out by a couple of years when the series was first released, I picked up a lot of the clues that were sprinkled through the series more than I did initially, so things didn't seem to come out of nowhere as much as they did the first time. I still have some thoughts on the ways I think the story could have gone better, but I'll save those for later, obviously. I have a black cat and I've been planning on putting her in this video, but she keeps wandering away every time I try to record, so just imagine a black cat laying behind me on the bed. Now, finishing this book means that I've kind of reached a turning point in what I'm doing here on this show, so I'm going to mention this up front. I do have a Patreon, patreon.com slash writingwomen, and you can go over there and support for as little as $2 a month and kind of get a say in where I'm going to go uh, next after I finish up this episode. Um, I have a choice of either going and reading Tempests and Slaughter or starting with the Emelon books. Now, the reason I wasn't thinking about doing Tempest and Slaughter is because it does not have a female main character and I am trying to kind of stick with female main characters. I'm going to run into that problem in the Emelon books as well because there are some that are from the perspective of Briar, but I don't know. I haven't decided which one I'm going to do yet. I'll, pro I'll probably do Tempest and Slaughter at some point, but I was thinking I wanted to switch over to the Emelon books initially now. Um, I don't know. I'm going to put it up for a vote on my... Patreon. So if you wanted to suggest something for me to do, you can head on over there. I appreciate all the support that I'm getting over there. It's really helped me out lately. Um, anyway, uh, now that that's over, let's get on with the show. We are now a few years after the end of Bloodhound. In that time, Becca has met, started a relationship with, gotten engaged to, had the relationship start to fall apart with, and eventually attended the funeral of Holborn a fellow dog from Daywatch. Their relationship was passionate, but not much else. In the latter portion of it, Holborn was abusive to Becca. He died because he wanted to gain glory storming an illegal slave auction and didn't wait for backup. Becca hadn't told anyone this, but she had been planning on breaking off the engagement with him anyway. After his funeral, Becca is woken up in the middle of the night and whisked away to a secret meeting with the Lord Provost. She, the constellation cat Pounce, her scent hound Achu, and her two-legged dog partner Tunstall are being sent on a secret mission along with a kennel mage from Blue Harbor, Farmer Cape. Farmer seems at first to be a simpleton without much power. Becca quickly figures out that his behavior is an act. Farmer later confirms this. He says that not all mages can be trusted, and it's helpful if other mages think that he isn't very capable, so they won't see him as a threat. At the Summer Palace, they are given their mission. The young Prince Gareth has been kidnapped after a violent, magical, and physical assault on the vacation spot for the royal family. The king and his young queen are completely undone by their son's kidnapping. The king had kind of been known for years as a bit of a buffoon who only cared about beautiful women until he married his current queen, Jessamine. Jessamine took an active interest in ruling the realm, and that prompted King Roger to become more interested as well. They began trying to regulate mages in the country to stop them running wild and above the law. They also want to introduce licensing and training requirements along with crown service for mages. This prompts many mages to work together with Roger's brother Baird to kidnap the only heir to the throne and eventually put Baird in his brother's place. The traders use the slave trade to mask their plotting by using it to get spies as slaves all over Tortal and eventually transport the kidnapped prince undetected in a slave caravan. The ships that brought the raiders to the Summer Palace were sunk in the harbor. A small contingent of the traders left with the prince along the river and got rid of the people aboard the ships to reduce the amount of people in the plot. Becca and Achu are able to begin tracking the prince's scent and figure out that he was not aboard the sunken ships. The Lady Knight Sabine of McKay Hill, Tunstall's lover, joins them on the hunt. They are well outfitted by the crown for their journey and sent on their way with orders to keep their quarry a secret. They can't let the realm know that the heir is in peril. The queen specifically is losing her mind over her son's kidnapping, and Becca comforts her. As the quartet follows the slave caravan north, the purpose of the kidnapping slowly unfolds. 
The spirit of the murdered Lord High Chancellor of Mages, Lazamon of Bucklin, comes to Becca on a pigeon and explains the spell placed on the royal family causes the king and queen to suffer as their son does, in hopes that it will eventually cause him to fall ill and die. The conspirators do everything in their power to slow down or completely stop their pursuers. They even destroy an important bridge that spans a marsh, killing the trade in, out, and through that region and forcing the hunters to hire a guide to lead them through the marsh island by island, which obviously takes them a bit of extra time. They find multiple instances of magical destruction in the wake of the traders. Early on near the Summer Palace, they find a melted pool of dead human bodies and fish out bits of metal and other things that weren't destroyed with magic to try and identify people who may have been killed. There are magical barriers placed in their path that kill everything that touches them, and Farmer has to destroy them before they can move on. The trail eventually leads to Five Queen's Grace, where Count Doen, Doen? Do, Doen? Doen? I don't know. And his wife, Eeldra, are hosting Prince Baird. Queen's Grace follows the belief of the gentle mother. The women of the house tut-tut at Sabine and Becca for their coarse lifestyle and insist that they would be more fulfilled by motherhood and the cultivation of a gentle spirit. They try to bully Becca into wearing a dress to dinner, but are rebuffed by the combined efforts of the party as Becca is on duty and cannot remove her uniform. The group is split up and investigating separately when a Chu picks up Gareth's scent again. She and Becca follow it through the kitchen and find a young slave girl turning the spits. Becca tucks herself into a shadowy corner near the girl and talks to her. She takes the rags the girl had been using to protect her hands and uses her sewing kit to make them into easily usable pads while she chats with the girl. Her name is Lynette, and she tells Becca how she's only been turning the spits for a day or so since No Skin had been doing it before. No Skin is the name given to the slave boy Becca knows to be the prince. It refers to the rule that any punishments to the boy couldn't be visible on his skin. In thanks for the information she gets from Lynette, Becca tells her that if she ever needs anything, to find the nearest provost dog outpost and ask for Becca Cooper from Lower City Chorus. A chew takes Becca past Lynette into the rooms occupied by Prince Baird. She picks the lock and a chew leads her around the room. She realizes that Gareth had been made to serve his uncle in this room and that Baird must be in on the plot. The next morning, Becca and a chew find the body of Lynette. She has been killed and left as a message to the other slaves. None of them will talk to Becca and her team anymore. Tunstall reveals that he was offered a bribe the night before by the conspirators and that he accepted so they wouldn't kill him, then asks Farmer to protect him with magic because they took a lock of his hair to ensure his loyalty. Sabine had been held up by the prince and Becca had met an ancient dust spinner in the courtyard that picked her up and showed her things in thanks for Becca's gift of dirt. They now know that the slave train they were looking for has already left. They try to leave, but the Count tries to stop them. Of course it is because he is part of the conspiracy and he wants the slavers to have more time to get away, but he claims it is because he doesn't believe the provost's seal on their orders is real. Prince Baird steps in and reprimands the Count for calling Sabine's honor into question and orders the Count to let them leave. Becca wonders why he would do this if he was in on the plot. On the road, Achu has the scent again, but they now must assume they have enemies at their back. They make camp and in the night are attacked by a large group of bandits. The smaller group fight fiercely and take out a large number of the attackers. One of them manages to knife a chew, and once the hound is out of commission, the bandits flee. Farmer tries to save a chew but can't, and he lets Becca know that she seems to be holding on just to say goodbye. Becca goes to a chew, and Pounce says that he doesn't care about the rules and tells Becca to step away from a chew. He touches her and uses his power to heal her. He explains that the great gods will punish him for this, but that it may be a while before that happens. They are at a crossroads in time, and the gods can't even see what's going to happen. He thinks that the goddess will take his side, and that Mithros may as well, because he is the patron of the provost guard's four-legged dogs. They keep going and find more poison traps. Tunstall tries to insist they carry on, but Farmer refuses. Leaving the poison could affect the whole countryside. Then later on, they stay at an inn, and in the middle of the night, it is set on fire. Becca is awake and is able to warn people when the blaze begins and save some of the staff and guests. Sabine and Tunstall had been sharing a room on the floor that was destroyed by fire and didn't have time to grab their supplies before fleeing. They lose all their supplies, but they have to press on. Becca says prayers for the dead, and wood pigeons carrying the spirits of the dead talk to her. They give her a description of the man who set the blaze at the inn, and Becca reports it to the innkeeper. On the road again, they find the cart the prince had been transported in, along with a large group of bodies, this time including the Viper, one of the two powerful mages involved in the plot. Becca wants to take time to bury the dead, but Tunstall insists they press on. The Black God appears to Becca and tells her not to worry. 
He uses his power to cover the bodies in earth and growing things. Achu runs off after the scent again and is caught into a magical trap. Becca follows and is knocked unconscious. When she wakes, she is tied to her horse and riding next to a beautiful mage. Dulce's silk web specializes in illusion magic. She and Elliot of Aspen Vale are escorting the hunters to Five Halliburn. The Lady Knight Namala of Halliburn has history with Sabine. Namala is part of the plot, but only out of duty to her father. Five Halliburn is where the traitors have decided to f- up their mistreatment of the prince. They now beat him openly, starve him, and allow infection to fester around his new shackles. They have decided that it is time to harm him more to activate the spell that will ultimately kill his parents. Sabine is offered a deal. She is offered marriage to Prince Baird for her complicity with the plot, and she agrees on the condition that she keep Tunstall on the side. Baird agrees and frees the two, then imprisons and tortures Becca and Farmer. The two are put in a cell together after a few days because the jailers want to use their growing affection for each other as leverage. They make out a bit and form their plan of escape. The plan, unfortunately, includes Farmer pooping out the item he had hidden in his butt. It's a ribbon he had been storing a vast amount of magic in. He gets them out and sends Becca to go after Prince Gareth, but Elliot of Aspen Vale stops them and battles it out with Farmer. Becca finds slave children in the kitchen, and among them is Gareth. She is able to convince him and at least one of the other slaves to escape with her, and they go back to the dungeon to find the escape route. Farmer rejoins them. He won his magical battle. Gareth is afraid of mages now and is thus afraid of Farmer, but he calms a little bit after seeing Becca and Farmer interact with each other. Sabine, Tunstall, and Namala are sneaking down with supplies and run into them. Namala has decided to betray her father for her loyalty to the king. Tunstall tries to demand the second boy stay behind, but the boy insists. He says he will raise the alarm if he stopped from escaping with Becca. They escape, but Becca is uneasy. She feels like the escape went too smoothly. They get to a nearby village, and Tunstall grabs some horses for them. Tunstall and Becca ride off while the two lady knights and farmers stay behind to fight the pursuers. Prince Gareth and the other boy ride behind Becca and Tunstall, respectively. Tunstall's horse balks at a river crossing, and Becca rides ahead. She stops to clean out her horse's hoof and sets the prince in a hiding spot with a chew to guard him at the sound of pursuit. Tunstall comes out of the darkness with his horse, and the boy is missing. He claims the boy fell off at the river and cracked his head. Becca's unease grows as Tunstall asks where Gareth is. Becca claims her horse went lame, and Tunstall says he will take the boy then and keep riding while Becca catches up later. She says she will take the boy on Tunstall's horse since she is lighter and easier for the horse to carry, but he refuses. She puts the pieces together and realizes Tunstall is the traitor in their group. When they bribed him at Queen's Grace, he was serious about accepting it. He had been leading the traitors to them and tried to help them kill a Chew, all for the promise of a noble title and the ability to be respectable enough to marry Sabine. They fight, and Becca is able to win by breaking Tunstall's oft-shattered knees. Sabine and Namala had been catching up and heard Tunstall's confession. Sabine loved Tunstall despite his lack of nobility, but she can't forgive him for this. Tunstall later dies of shock and comes to Becca on a pigeon to say goodbye. They begin the long ride home as armies converge on the traitor's fiefs. Farmer had gotten a message to his old mentor, Cassine Catfoot, who carried it to the proper officials. They are met on the road by Queen Jessamine. Despite her sickly condition from the malicious spell, she rode in a carriage to meet them and be reunited with her son. Back in Chorus, Farmer and Becca have settled down together and agree to marry on All Hallows so that the Black God can attend if he wants to, and also because Pounce will be punished come midwinter. He says the gods will likely confine him to the Divine Realms for a century or two. Farmer also tells Becca that he will take her last name because he's not very attached to his own. Becca is sent a fancy dress uniform by Lord Gershom, and he arrives to bring her and Farmer to the palace. He doesn't tell Becca till the last minute what is going on, because he knew she would refuse to come otherwise. In front of the entire court, and many of the provost's dogs, the royal family award the companions gifts and thanks for what they did. Fife Queen's Grace was dissolved and is now Prince Hold. The king awards this fife and all its holdings to Sabine. He awards Farmer the property in the city that he'd been looking at and trying to buy as a home for him and Becca, along with four horses to travel for all the work they are being offered. Becca had only asked for her family to be taken care of, so the king says to the gathering that he asked his son what he thought Becca would want. Gareth said that both he and Becca wanted the same thing, so the king grants it. He abolishes slavery in Tortal, and the proclamation is signed by Gareth and Becca as witnesses. In the epilogue, we return to George and Eleni. George has just become the youngest rogue in history, and Eleni tells them that he shames his ancestor. George takes the figures of Becca and Pounce from his family shrine because he thinks it's a great joke for his famous guardswoman ancestor to watch over his doings as the rogue. The cat has returned and removes the memory of Becca's companion having purple eyes from George's mind, so he won't recognize the cat as faithful when he soon meets Alan of Trayvond. That's it. 
with what was for a long time the last book set in Tortal, we have officially circled back to George meeting Alana at the beginning of her story. There are two things in this book that I see brought up most often. The first being Tunstall's betrayal, and the second being how unrealistic it is for Becca to stay with a man who is abusive toward her. I'll talk about the Tunstall thing first, because I think he is an example of Tammy's subtly connecting dots that are difficult to see at first glance. Tunstall betrays Becca, betrays the dogs, and betrays his country for what many don't agree are believable reasons. I don't exactly agree with this, but I don't disagree either. I can't really make my mind up on it. He has shown through the whole series to have a temper and to be very set in his ideas about the world. This book goes a lot harder in hammering home his less desirable qualities because it needs to set up his betrayal at the end. It feels like those characteristics were there the whole time, but not lingered on, so they were easy to gloss over in reading the previous books. Something I noticed this time is that the pattern of Becca's partner's betrayals was set up from the beginning of book two. She got a name for herself as being impossible to partner with because of her strong sense of morality and how a dog should act. At the end of Bloodhound, she is relieved to be permanently partnered with Tunstall after Goodwin takes a nice desk job. Both Goodwin and Tunstall are getting too old for this, like Goodwin says. She has her house and her husband to go home to every night. Tunstall has his lady Sabine, but chafes under the knowledge that he will never have the life that he wants with her. He convinces himself that Sabine only doesn't want to get married because of his lack of status. He has a vision for what he wants and underestimates Sabine. He frequently shows insecurity about her and masks it with jokes about other noble men that she is very good friends with. His desire to keep her drives him to violent extremes that blindside everybody around him. That side of him could have been focused on more early in the books, but I get it. I don't think that's completely out of character for him. Shocking and heartbreaking, yes, but not out of the realm of possibility. The thread of Becca constantly being disappointed by her partners winds up carrying through to now. It just took longer this time for her unshakable sense of duty and honor to put her at odds with the man she thought would be her salvation from corrupt dogs at her back. Now, let me get into Becca's relationship with Holborn. Every criticism I see of their relationship usually stems from a complete misunderstanding of the dynamics of abusive relationships. It usually boils down to, well, but why would Becca stay with someone who treats her like that? Why does anybody stay with an abusive partner? I love how we have a protagonist who is strong-willed and very independent who begins a relationship that she has no idea will become very controlling and abusive. It can happen to anybody, and to assume that somebody like Becca would never find herself in that situation implies that there's something inherently weaker or worse about women who find themselves with abusive partners. Nobody is immune to manipulation from a partner, and it is very important to show that in fiction, especially to the intended younger audience for the series. Understanding of domestic abuse is tragically minimal, and this could have been an opportunity to explore it in a palatable way. My only complaint here is that it all happens off-screen, so to speak. That relationship coming together then falling apart is much more compelling to me than what we got. Holborn lives and dies completely off-screen, and Becca meets Farmer then agrees to marry him less than a month later after weeks of traumatic experiences together, and a lot of traumatic experiences before that with her previous partner. I love Farmer, but, and this gets back to my unpopular opinion about Dana Numere, I think it's a little irresponsible to write a young adult story that shows a relationship less than a month old being absolutely perfect and happy and let's get married. As I've also brought up before, this is a fantasy world completely in control of the author, so if she says Becca and Farmer are perfect together and live happily ever after, then yes, that is what happens. This is one of those times where I feel like the creator has a responsibility to their audience, however, to portray things in a responsible way, because they have a lot of influence over their audience. In real life, it is a terrible idea to get engaged after knowing somebody for a month. I watched it happen over and over while I was in the Navy. It happens so much that it is an actual meme on military humor pages. The fresh-faced 18-year-old sailor meets a girl a week after boot camp and proposes on their second date. Or you go to your follow-on training after boot camp and before you can even graduate from there, you're engaged to a classmate. Or my favorite, and the one that I think most aligns with this, you start dating during a deployment together and get married when you get back. Now, the reason this is such a well-known joke is because these marriages almost always result in divorce, despite how completely over the moon in love you were when you said I do. Now, for every time you talk about something like this, you'll have people pop up telling you, well, I married my partner after we dated for three weeks and we're still together 40 years later. And yes, I understand that sometimes it can work out. It just makes me personally uncomfortable to see a month-long relationship shown this way after all the times I have watched in real time as relationships like this end in absolute disaster once the thrill of the initial infatuation is gone and the reality of living together every single day sets in. Ultimately, I do like Becca and Farmer together. I just wish their timeline was developed more, or even that we had a fourth book to develop them and have this one instead show us Becca falling for an abuser. I'm glad she didn't end up with Rosto because it would definitely be against everything she believes in. Though I do wish we saw 
anything of Rosto in this book, or really any of Becca's friends in the beginning or end aside from extremely brief passing mentions. This book seemed almost too long for me, and yet it still managed to not bring up any of the characters we know and love at this point. Goodwin's total absence was especially noticeable after Bloodhound. I did like seeing another Lady Knight in this book. It helps drive home what a different time pre-Gentle Mother Tortal was, to see that Sabine is absolutely not an outlier, and there are more Lady Knights out there. It's also nice to have her and Becca getting closer. We get more of her than just the Lady Knight who is also banging Tunstall. She's funny, clever, outgoing, and very open when talking to Becca about the way some men treat her, even knowing that she's a knight. Her personality, I think, is more boisterous than that of the other Lady Knights we are familiar with, so she is really formed into a distinct character for me here. Her play acting with the gentle mother followers about her sworn duty to bring home a child to his mother and the undying power of a mother's love for her child was a great scene. She knew how to get them on her side and to get them to help the hunters on their way. Though that brings me back to Goodwin's absence in the book. Sabine took the place that Goodwin occupied in previous installments. Becca even mentions how she was planning to ask Sabine to be the godmother to her first child and it just makes me like, what about Goodwin though? The woman who taught you everything you know and mentored you for years? It made me a little sad to see Goodwin sidelined so hard. Like, there's only room for one female mentorship role in Becca's life. Overall, I love this series. More now than I did before. So many bits of the story that felt sudden in my initial read as the books were released feel much more natural when rereading the books closer together. I may have my complaints about the style and some story complaints here and there, but I think this is one of the strongest overall series in this universe. Each book is consistent in its storytelling, though maybe a little bloated here and there. I have finished all of the books in Tortal that feature a female protagonist, so, like I said before, I have a choice. Thank you for sticking with me through my time back in Tortal. Your feedback in public and private has kept me going at this, and I really appreciate all of you. Thank you to my current patrons, Mary Doc Brandybuck, Ms. Psycho, Amy Chu, aka The Doctor, Lord Butterbutt, and Bruce.